President Robinson, thank you for being with us in Rome. You are here to talk about climate change, but at the same time, it's International Women's Day. So what do women have to do with climate change? Women should care and indeed be thought about more than men in the context of climate, because climate change undermines food security, makes it more difficult to get water during prolonged drought, and it changes the uh, reality of women's lives. They're more vulnerable and they have different responsibilities, particularly to provide food for their children. So the gender dimensions of climate change are very, very important and they're part of what I call climate justice because climate change is not a neutral thing. It's a very unjust uh, uh, thing in its impact on people. Uh, it affects the poorest more than rich countries, but it's rich countries who have generated these greenhouse gas emissions from use of fossil fuel. And so that led me to establish a, a foundation on climate justice to bring home that injustice. So would you say that climate injustice is worse for women than for men? By starting with a people-centred approach and focusing on the impacts that it's having and giving voice to those most affected, listening to them and then addressing their concerns. And uh, their concerns are acute because the impacts are very real and they have not planned for them. Um, they are unpredictable and they need access to means for adaptation, new technologies, new seeds, um, greater uh, access to clean energy in particular, which is the good side of moving to a zero uh, a carbon neutral uh, world. What are the three things that we could give women, do for women, empower women to do right now so that climate justice is improved for them in the next five to ten years? First of all, I think it actually um, makes it more necessary to empower women and bring out the gender impacts of climate on food security. Um, and secondly, I think it's important that women themselves in positions of leadership speak out on this issue. Uh, my foundation is planning, um, together with UN Women, a women's leadership forum just before the climate summit in September so that women can speak directly at all different levels of leadership, political leadership, business women, women in academia, indigenous women, local community women in leadership in their communities. And women also are more conscious of another injustice of climate, which is intergenerational injustice. Uh, we know we should know that we are unfairly using up the carbon budget. Uh, rich countries have been doing it and should be cutting back and cutting their emissions much more severely if we're going to stay below two degrees warming above pre-industrial standards. And we're not on course for that. Um, that means that uh, the impacts are going to be more severe for our grandchildren and their children. And I think women naturally are more conscious of this and it is an issue that can bring all countries of the world together um, you know we're all parents grandparents who care about our children and yet we are consigning our children to a very unsafe and insecure world if we don't change our habits what role do you see for rule of law approaches in terms of improving climate justice and in particular for idlo i think rule of law is very important in combating climate change uh, because climate change exacerbates vulnerabilities. People who already may not have access to justice find themselves in an even more difficult uh, position. Uh, it may well be that for richer parts of the world it will mean more litigation. Um, I envisage the, the likelihood of more litigation in the future um, against uh, those who are failing to provide the regulatory environment, um, uh, against corporations that are uh, polluting, etc. But um, I think the importance is that we need governance in a fair and um, uh, just way um, in the context now of the way that climate change is undermining poverty, is, un is undermining food security, is making it more difficult to, to access water, is going to potentially mean that we have mass movement of people because of flooding, because of drought. And at the moment, we don't have a regime for climate uh, displaced people. We call them climate refugees, but they're not refugees like 
refugees who have the 1951 Convention. So uh, we need to think about laws on adaptation, on mitigation. I was very glad to see only a week ago a, a Globe fourth report which um, identified the fact that there is much more climate legislation now than there has ever been. I think there were 500 pieces of legislation passed in very recent years. That's part of a rule of law to deal with climate. And the role of IDLO is that it has the capacity to uh, share experiences in different regions of the world, to work on uh, land reform and other laws that are relevant to uh, adaptation to climate change, and then bring that experience to different parts of the world. I'm on the advisory board of IDLO, and I'm a great supporter of the potential of IDLO working in the area of climate change. You talk of legislation, which implies working with governments and working at the international level, uh, but at the same time you talk about giving women a voice. So what is the balance between working in an international framework, working on legislation, and working with civil society itself? We have to strike a better balance in listening to those who are on the front line. Uh, I used an example this morning of a conference which my foundation organised with the Irish government last year during Ireland's presidency of the European Union. I know Italy is coming into that presidency in the second half of this year. Uh, we brought together uh, those who are on the front line of coping with climate change. And they're not just victims, they're agents for change because they know and they have indigenous knowledge of adaptation. And they think in very holistic ways about their communities. They don't think in boxes on agriculture and boxes on health and boxes on energy. Um, they, they're more holistic. And I think we need to learn to work well. I was pleased to learn this morning uh, from uh, the head of um, FAO, uh, Jose Graciano da Silva, that he sees the need for much more partnership now between UN agencies, including FAO, and uh, the civil society and the business sector. I think IDLO also uh, can work more effectively, as I know um, it's doing under the leadership of Irene Khan, by reaching out also to civil society and the business sector in looking at land laws and looking at corporate responsibility and looking at the various areas of rule of law. President Robinson, thank you for being with us in Rome. Okay, pleasure. Thank you.